Hey there, lawyers. So as part of the Happy Lawyer Project, I'm always testing out new ideas and products so I can share tips and strategies for living your best life. That's why I'm super excited to be partnering with Felix Gray Glasses. Like most lawyers, I spend a lot of time in front of my computer screen and over the last few years have become accustomed to the headaches, dry eyes, and blurry vision that comes with spending countless hours in front of a screen. Turns out I was not going blind, and there was a simple solution, computer glasses. Who knew? Felix Gray's beautifully crafted glasses have changed my life. Not only do my eyes feel so much better, but the glasses allow me to be more productive in those afternoon hours and help me sleep better after working late into the night. Best of all, Felix Gray offers free shipping and a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're someone like me who spends way more than six hours a day in front of a computer, I would definitely recommend you give them a try. Head over to felixgrayglasses.com forward slash happy lawyer to let them know I sent you. Welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project. I'm your host, Akoma Moronu, and I created this show to help lawyers find happiness in life with a law degree. Together with my guests, we provide the knowledge, skills, insight, inspiration, and encouragement you need to find your happy. On today's show, I chat with law school graduate and impact strategist Avery Blank about what she believes is the difference between confidence and courage, what it takes to cultivate a little bit of both, how to use those skills to tackle those opportunities you want most, even when you feel like you're not quite ready. And she explains why she thinks being uncomfortable is the new comfortable and why it's an important skill to master if you want to be successful in your life and career. There's lots of awesome little nuggets in here, guys, so I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Happy Lawyer Project. I am really excited, you guys, today to introduce you to Avery Blank. Avery, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Okomi. So it would be great if you could just start with giving a brief description of who you are and what it is that you do. I am an impact strategist where I help my clients both professionals and organizations to advocate for themselves and leverage opportunities so that they can increase their impact, influence, and exposure. That could range anywhere from working with a woman professional to position herself for a board seat or working with an organization to think strategically about how to engage women or millennials uh, or to become market leaders so that they can increase their influence. Related to that work, I'm also a contributor uh, with Forbes and the World Economic Forum on leadership issues. Uh, I'm on a board with the American Bar Association and have played roles in the Women in Law Hackathon that was sponsored by Stanford University and Bloomberg Law, where I led my team to win second place. And then recently, I also published an article with my colleague Scott Westfall from Harvard on millennials and how to engage millennials, and particularly in the legal profession. Now, prior to all the work uh, that I currently do, I focus a lot on public policy. So I've worked at the federal, state, and local levels of government, as in the private sector with government, on a variety of policy issues. And I really enjoy policy because it's about creating a big impact on, you know, family members, community members, your neighbors. Um, and so that I leverage as a way in terms of my work in advocacy and helping my clients now to be better advocates for themselves. There's so much there that I am excited to dive into. I love Scott. I think he's phenomenal. Um, having had the opportunity to work with him and be taught by him through the Millbank at Harvard program, I just you know, think he's a great resource in the legal profession. And Anusha Jalepsi, who now works with him, was previously on the show. And I think she's also a phenomenal resource. So having you guys on the show is, I'm really excited to talk about the work that you do, because I think that not just the law and the practice of the law 
but it's really about the business of law and being a practitioner in the profession that I don't know a lot of lawyers spend time thinking and talking about. And unfortunately, most lawyers are not business minded necessarily. And so they haven't put a lot of thought into how to manage their business, you know, and think of themselves as the service provider. They've really focused on how to learn the law and be really good at their job. And I think it's important yeah. also to note that you are a lawyer. So you can speak to kind of our experience as law school students and young lawyers. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's right. I mean, we are not taught for the most part. We're not taught, you know, the business of law. And that really the legal profession is just like any other industry. It is a business, you know, but unfortunately for, for most of us, we're not taught those skills. However, I will say when I was in law school at the University of Maryland, I was selected as a Rose Zetzer Fellow in the Women Leadership and Equality Program. And that program teaches prospective female attorneys how to better advocate for themselves as well as how to better advocate for women in society at large. And in that fellowship, I was taught, you know, rainmaking, business development skills, uh, organizational dynamics communication differences between genders, really, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts practical aspects of what it takes for a lawyer to succeed in the business of law. I was, you know, had the opportunity to gain those skills. And I wish that more and more lawyers had that opportunity. And that's also partly, you know, why I do what I do uh, is to is to really support those uh, lawyers, you know, wh women and men, and really, you know, position them, themselves for success in the business of law. I think that some lawyers, in some ways, hide behind their proficiency at practicing in order to not have to do kind of that other aspect. They think the work will speak for itself, I guess is the way to put that. And they don't have the confidence in their ability to sell their work. So I would love to dive right in and chat a little bit more about how you gain that confidence and would be interested in how you think about confidence. How would you define confidence? Yeah. So, you know, having, having confidence is really having the faith, you know, in what you have in your skills and, and who you are. I think that's, you know, really it's about confidence is, is about certainty you know, and there is a difference. Some people talk about confidence and some people talk about courage. And I do think that there is a difference. So as I said, you know, confidence is having faith in, in what you have, in your skills, in who you are. But courage is having faith in knowing that you can achieve something you don't already have. So again, to, to juxtapose the two terms, confidence is certainty, but courage kind of lacks certainty. And so it's this, it's either I've got this versus I don't know I've got this, but I'll figure it out. You know, so it's, that's, you know, something that I think we all have to have a dose of, we have to have a dose of confidence and courage. And so how would you describe the difference between, I mean, so when you say certainty, I want to be careful there because it's not, I don't necessarily want to say that it's certainty with respect to the outcome. Do you know what I mean? Because I want people to be confident because I think that's where people get hung up is that they do think they have the skills and they do think that they could do it, but they aren't a hundred percent certain that they're going to get that job or that they're going to get that raise. So how do you kind of, you know, sort that out for people who are like, yeah, I know that I'm really smart. Yeah, I know I could do it, but I'm not certain that it's going to happen for me. Yeah. So there's only so much that you can control, right? And so you really can't worry about the things that are out of your control. What you worry and focus on is what is in your control. So what you can do, what you, your skills are to be able to, you know, do something. You can't worry about the things that, you know, you can't control. And then I, I agree. I think that that's right. It's a certainty in within yourself, right? Like who you are and what your skill sets are and what you're bringing to the table. Right. So then we get to the next question, which is I think most people would ask is if it's something you've never done before, how do you even get to the – how do you even know if your skill sets are – if, if you are ready enough? 
Do you know what I mean? Because when you're going for a promotion, you're going for a new job, you're trying to pivot into a new profession, it's hard to know and be confident that what you've done is enough to make you successful in that new endeavor. Yeah, and that question or the answer to that question really hinges on the word ready. Like, what is the meaning of ready? And to me, there's two definitions. And it's either you're ready to do it as is. So, you know, let's say, you know, you've, you're looking at a job description and you look at it and you say, oh yeah, I can jump right in. I, you know, I can do that. No problem. Or you're ready to figure it out. Meaning the sense that, oh yeah, you know, I know some things, I have some of these requirements. I don't have some of these, but I know I can figure it out. I'm smart enough to figure it out. So the bottom line is you've got to decide on, you know, what does ready mean to you? Does it mean you're ready to actually do it as is, or that you're ready to figure out what you don't know? You know, and I will say that certainly the latter is harder, uh, you know, especially for women because of that confidence, competence dichotomy, which we can talk about a little bit later. But there's part of that in, in order for you to grow, in order for you to advance, you've got to put yourself out there and say that even if there are some things that you know you haven't done before, but you know you can, that still means that you're ready to do it. That's great advice. I think that's absolutely correct. And I would love for you to touch on the confidence competency dichotomy because I think that's super important, especially for women. And I know some people are going to feel a little prickly when you say that because, you know, people don't like to make broad generalization about men and women. And so, you know, take that for what it is. And, but I love your thoughts on that, the dichotomy. Yeah. So, you know, there's been a lot of research done and, you know, specifically the one resource that pops up into my head is the book called The Confidence Code by Caddy K and Claire Shipman. And, you know, they talk about how to really be aware of the confidence, competence dichotomy. And I remember there's one example that they talk about in the research where there was a female uh, in a client meeting and, you know, she didn't speak up. And the male partner, uh, because she didn't speak up, felt like, you know, she wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, ready to handle you know, client interaction or something like that. But he didn't want to bring it up because he wasn't quite sure, you know, how to handle the subject because it was a little bit, you know, of a touchy subject, you know. And so there's this notion that the woman, she probably, you know, was absolutely, you know, competent in it, but she wasn't quite sure whether she should and it had, you know, had the confidence to be able to speak up. But because of that, because she didn't, you know, speak up, then it had negative consequences on how she was perceived, you know, by others. And so there are some real, con- you know, consequences uh, of this confidence, competence dichotomy. And why do you think it affects women more than men? Do you have any, like, I don't know if you've read any research or if you had any personal experience with that or conversations that you've had around that specifically? Yeah, there, you know, people have probably heard this before, but a lot of times, you know, when a man and a woman look at the same job description and, you know, a man will say, oh, I've got some of these jobs, I've got some of these requirements, you know, but not all. I can, you know, apply for the job. The woman has to feel like she needs every single requirement in order for her uh, to be able to apply confidently for the job. And so, again, it goes to being, it goes to the meaning of what's being ready. The man thinks, you know, oh, I know some of this stuff and I'm ready to figure out the rest. Many times women feel like they have to be ready to, you know, to know everything and not necessarily figure, you know, figure it out uh, the rest at the time. So, you know, I think that that is, you know, really con- consequential because what's happening there is that women are taking themselves with a running uh, for opportunities that they could very well do as equally well or better than the male candidate could. And and I think that's part of the reason why I really wanted to be careful with that certainty point, because I think it feeds into that mindset that women already have, that they want to be certain that they're going to be 100% competent on the first day. And I, in fact, advocate that having that sense of, I don't necessarily know everything, makes you more curious and makes you 
more hungry to learn when you get there. Whereas perhaps a male counterpart who thinks 60% is good enough doesn't have that same drive to get to 100 because they think that the 60 is enough. And I'm not trying to pit men against women. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to help people reframe that feeling of not being ready enough because it is really scary. And I don't know if you have any tips for simple ways that people can build their confidence. Yeah. I think that, first of all, as lawyers, we are smart. So you will figure out what you don't know. And feeling uncomfortable is the new uncomfortable. So if you feel uncomfortable, that means you're in the right place. You know, but then you also have to ask, you know, yourself, again, that question, if you're willing to allow someone who has the same or less ability to take advantage of an opportunity you could have had, you know, really ask yourself every single time you might question uh, your competence or confidence, ask yourself, would I allow someone else who has the same or less ability to take advantage of an opportunity that I could have? And, you know, th- you know, really gut your check. You know, do you feel comfortable letting an opportunity go? And if you do, well, then you're making the right decision. But if you don't, then you be- then go for it Just- and go for it with gusto. I love that, especially the gusto part, right? Like just, if you're going to put yourself out there, put yourself out there all the way. Because there's not like any failing halfway, right? You're either going to get it or you're not. So like, I think sometimes people want to preserve a sense of like embarrassment by not really wanting it. So they almost don't go for it and they self-sabotage. Right. So personally speaking, how do you kind of, what is your self-talk around this? Like, I'm sure you've had to go give a speech for the first time to a group that you've never spoken to and that might make you nervous. I don't know what types of things make you nervous at this stage in your career, but is there something you tell yourself to help you overcome? Because for me personally, it's not that I've stopped feeling uncomfortable. As you said, uncomfortable is the new comfortable, but I've just learned how to be in that discomfort. What do you do to kind of manage that? Yeah. So there's a book called Self-Made Billionaire Effect, How Extreme Producers Create Massive Value. And there's a line in that book that I really almost every day live my life by. And that is, risk is losing the opportunity, not failing in the attempt. So again, risk, risk is losing the opportunity, not failing in the attempt. So here, what we're doing is re- we're reframing what risk really is. So in the sense that you may think something is a risk, but it really isn't. And you know, how I live my day-to-day life is that, you know, if I'm not failing every day, then that's telling me that I'm not pushing myself enough. And what I mean by failing is not some big, you know, type of thing, but I'm thinking like, if I reach out to someone and I don't hear back, you know, that's, you know, you know, unfortunately, like that's a disappointment. That's a failure. You know, putting yourself out there, that's really important. And so if you're not failing, you know, even little things every day, that means you're not pushing yourself enough. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of a proverb uh, that I happened to actually, uh, when I was opening up a recent Chinese fortune cookie, and it, it, it said on the, on the fortune is that a bold attempt is half a success. And so as you try, as you start thinking strategically about how you want to advance your career, there are times where you're going to have to be bold. And it doesn't, and even the word bold doesn't mean it has to be big. It just means that you've got to do something that you might not otherwise do or that feels a little bit uncomfortable. And so this boldness, you know, these, you know, taking risks, all of them, you may think that they're big deals, but they're in fact not because the worst thing that you can do is, you know, kind of be in the status quo and not do anything. You've got to take, you know, take that one step forward to be able to put yourself out there to advance. I love that. I love, I love quotes. I love proverbs. <laughs> I think that they can be sometimes a little, you know, cheesy, but I think they're so helpful kind of as mantras to yourself when you're going through these things. And unfortunately, All of this is great, and it's great to have confidence. It's great to go for things, but ultimately, everybody's going to end up at a point in their life where they feel like they've bit off more than they can chew, 
they get to that new job, they get to that speech, they get, and it doesn't go well. You know, like it's really not going well. I don't know if you've had an experience like this. Obviously, you say that you're trying to fail in small ways, but sometimes we are going to fail in big ways. You know, I don't think that what we're trying to say to people here is that it's, you secretly can do it. So every time you do it, it's going to be a success. Sometimes it's not. And I don't know if you have, I'd be interested if you have any tips for people who feel like they may have gone a little too boldly this time. (laughs) Yeah. You know, the first thing is that you just have to accept that you may be over your head. Uh, you need to have a self-realization, a self-awareness, a gut check, really, that you may be over your head. And then the next thing, once you realize that, you have that self-awareness, then you need to have the humility to ask for help. Because really, when you're asking for your help, you're not admitting your weakness. You're admitting your self-awareness and your strengths, the fact that you are self-aware. So again, while you may think that that's a risky move, you know, showing maybe some vulnerability and that you may be overhead in the long run, it actually uh, will help you and benefit you with your career. And then you, once that you ask for help, learn from it, figure out where, you know, what it is that, you know, you may have overstepped or one step, you know, that may have gone awry, figure out what that is and then learn from it so that it doesn't happen again and that you can share that message with other people. So, you know, bottom line is is that, you know, going over your head, being over your head and then asking for help, you know, is not a weakness. Having self-awareness is a strength, but as long as as you learn from it. And, you know, being a leader is being self-aware. You know, that's that's the whole thing. Leaders understand what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, where they need help, where they might have gone over their head. And so that's really important to demonstrate. So again, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're over your head, you re- in, in order to actually leverage the opportunity, you may feel like you're in a really bad situation, but that there, at, there is some opportunity there to show and demonstrate your leadership and being self-aware. That's right. I, I think that that's where learning happens, right? Like real learning happens because often if you're only succeeding, that does mean that you're only working within your wheelhouse and you're not developing new skills and it can be painful to grow. Speaking of books and quotes, and I'm going to butcher this one, but in The Crossroads and Should and Must, she uses this, she compares self-growth to that of a snake where it gets to the point where your skin almost feels too tight and the only way to get through it is to kind of bust out of that old skin into your new skin. But when your new skin is growing, you're vulnerable and it kind of hurts. And until that new skin kind of develops and hardens, you are in this vulnerable space and you don't know if it's going to be successful and you're going to make it through. But the only way through it is through it. So I think that people should be more open to failure than they are. And I think lawyers are particularly risk averse, which is our training and, you know, what our clients pay us for, but not necessarily helpful in our personal and professional lives. Yeah. I mean, look, we're human, you know, and so, you know, actually showing, making mistakes and then showing that vulnerability that actually works for us. Initially, it might not. It may feel terrible having (laughs) made that mistake, Uh, you know, but ultimately you have the opportunity to show vulnerability which can show, you know, some leadership about self-awareness, but also is the opportunity to really connect, you know, on a human level with people. And that's really, that's where you also see, you know, leadership is, you know, really being able to connect uh, and understand and empathize, you know, with others. So there, there are many leaders, very high profile executives, you know, who have made mistakes, but those who have been successful are those who want to have been self-aware, who have admitted to their mistakes, and who've shown their vulnerability such that allows the public and their employees to see that, in fact, that they are human, just like them, uh, you know, and it overall, you know, works to their benefit. So again, you know, the goal is not to try and be over your head all the time. But if you are, there are ways, you know, and opportunities that you can leverage uh, ultimately 
that will allow you to be a better professional and better leader. And so what do you say to women, especially, I think, who feel that it's not, quote, I'm doing air quotes, professional to be emotional, to show vulnerability, that there needs to be this kind of, I will say, illusion of like, com- like consistent competence in the workplace. How do you walk that line of being perceived as professional and competent while showing your vulnerability and asking for help and putting yourself out there? Yeah, I think the number one thing is you have to be who you are. The most important thing for for a professional is to be authentic because once you start being someone who you're not, there's this concept called covering that's been researched by Deloitte and also a law professor at NYU about the concept of covering. And that is professionals at work who try and hide or downplay, uh, you know, who they really are. And that could be any aspect of them. Uh, you know, it could be characteristic traits. It could be race. It could be gender. It could be sexual orientation, whatever it might be. But bottom line is when people cover, when professionals cover, your productivity decreases and your effectiveness as a professional really decreases and your satisfaction and enjoyment in work decreases. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, telling women not to kind of be who they are, that has a real detrimental effect to their professional success and ultimately to the organization's success. So number one thing is try to be authentic. Now, I will say, you know, when it comes to, you know, emotions and extreme emotions, you know, there's always a balance, right? You know, almost everything in moderation. So when it comes to emotions, I mean, if you want to laugh out loud, that's fine. You know, if you feel, you know, emotional, you know, that's fine. But, you know, there are some instances where you may not want to be absolutely sobbing in a, in a public a team space, but, you know, it may be okay to shed a tear, you know, maybe on a one-on-one conversation, you know, with your manager. You know, so there are certain places where you may think about the extreme, but bottom line is the most important thing is be authentic. I think you touched on this a little, and so I'm going to push you just a little bit more on this because I know I get this question so much from minorities, LGBT associates, you know, candidates who are trying to enter the big law space, but feel like there is a disconnect between who they are naturally and authentically and what is expected in that workplace and almost to the point where they don't really even know what the professional version of themselves is. Does that make sense? Like there's the, I can just act like everybody else. And then there's the me, I am at home, but they don't know how to kind of figure out what them at work could look like, what, like what is appropriate. Do you have any tips? I don't know. Is there any resources for figuring out How do you act like yourself? It seems like a crazy question, like how do you be authentic? But I guess that's what I'm asking. How do you be authentic professionally? Yeah, it is really hard, especially, you know, in a risk adverse uh, profession like the legal industry, you know, because you want to go in, you know, being yourself, but you're not quite sure how, you know, things are, you know, initially the culture of the workplace. And so what I would say is, as you're moving forward, whether it's your first job or your next job, the most important thing is to test the cultural environment. What is the culture like? What is the management like? You know, so when you have interviews and when you're talking to potential future colleagues, you know, ask them questions about what's the management style like here? A lot of times, you know, that can provide insight as to, you know, whether people are inclusive or not, or whether they value authenticity. Ask them to take you around the office to get a sense of, you know, how people are working on a day-to-day environment and see, you know, whether doors are open, whether people are collaborating in, in front of, uh, you know, each other. The real test here is at the interview stage. And so while you may think they're interviewing you, you have the opportunity to interview them. And that's, where you really want to try and gauge what the organization's environment is like for their employees. That's really good advice. And I don't think that people 
think about that enough about interviewing the employee employer and obviously once you have the offer in hand you can do that more diligently and you should do right. it. you know i don't think enough people ask for those second interviews or for those more casual like coffees i think those are great opportunities to see what people are really like and if their personality feels authentic to you and if there's a good match there yeah exactly so we've talked about a number of different books. I love books. I'm such a proponent of, you know, <laughs> reading to learn about myself and how I could be developing per- personally and professionally. And I was wondering if you have any other fra- favorites that you would recommend or any other resources, whether they're books, podcasts, TED Talks, conferences, anything else that you've found useful that you think that young lawyers might find useful. Yeah, so in addition to The Confidence Code by Caddy K and Claire Shipman, I'd also certainly Sheryl Sandberg lean in. Amy Cuddy. Yep. She has, you know, the TED Talk on the power pose and how your physical stance can influence confidence. You know, that's also really interesting. You know, the other thing that I was thinking about when we're, when I'm thinking about resources really is the news. You know, I can't stress this enough is that Staying current about what's in the news is a career advancement strategy. So, you know, I talk about, you know, all these books, but just staying current with what's going on in the news is really helpful for professionals, not only just to be able to gather information and insights, but then also the more you learn about the landscape and what's going on in the world, the more opportunities you know you can identify for yourself in terms of you know what industries are hot or you know where there might be you know opportunities you know for speaking engagements or or what have you to really get yourself out there i think you know it's really important these days that that professionals really stay on top of the news it can be a daunting prospect because information and news is happening so quickly but, you know, just carving out, you know, 10 minutes a day in the morning or, you know, just to kind of peruse through the news to get a sense of what's going on is really helpful to make you an informed professional, but then also a strategic professional. That's an amazing tip and one I, hadn't, I haven't heard and haven't really thought about, but makes perfect sense. Do you have any favorites or any kind of core news outlets that you turn to, or even aggregators? I know there's a number of them now that you can get in your inbox. Yeah, so certainly the skim is a great, you know, quick tool to get a sense of what's going on the world. There are a lot of platforms now that produce newsletters that can be sent to your inbox every day. So depending on what your Uh, interests are, you know, go to that platform and they'll send you an aggregate of news. But then there's also interesting new forms in which news is being uh, presented. Now, CNN and NBC are introducing news on Snapchat. So, you know, if you don't have the time to watch it on TV or to go on a particular media platform's webpage, and you have Snapchat, well, then you can start, you know, listening to the news in three to five minute bites to kind of get an overview of, of what's happened. So the thing is that there are many different ways in which you can consume the news. And it's just to pick, you know, pick your preference. And would you advise that people become kind of broadly knowledgeable on all topics, like be able to talk high level about the state of affairs or to really niche down on the things they find most interesting and develop expertise in certain areas? Yeah, I think that really is an individual preference. And what I think you'll find is that they will very quickly just gravitate to what interests them. Some will be interested in all different types of news and others will just say, no, I just want to focus on technology or I just want to focus on IP you know, or I just want to focus on employment issues. That is something that, believe it or not, they notice if, if they can think about their behavior and where they gravitate in terms of news stories, they, they will do it regardless. Of, so they don't even really need to think about it. They will gravitate to what uh, interests them. I will say that having a broader view 
of what is going on maybe outside of the niche area that might interest to you or the area in which you work does help to provide context uh, in terms of helping you to better place and contextualize what your expertise is with what else is going around the world, because then you can better identify intersectionalities that can really open up hidden opportunities, particularly when it comes to identifying business opportunities for your organization. You know, you could start becoming the go-to person for understanding, you know, how uh, your work applies to different areas and how you can place a particular lens on a different area and then becoming an expert in those intersectionalities. That's a wonderful tip. And thank you so much for articulating it so well, because I think people do get really overwhelmed both with the amount of news that's being produced and how to consume it and then how to transition that into kind of a pro- pro- making it professionally useful for themselves. So as before we wrap up, I would love if you could just tell us a little bit more about where people can follow you and learn what, more about what you're up to and perhaps collaborate with you on future endeavors. Yeah. So I have a website, AveryBlank.com. So my first name, Avery, last name, Blank.com. Uh, I can be found on LinkedIn, on Twitter, at Blank Avery, and also as a contributor with Forbes and the World Economic Forum, you can find me on those platforms as well. I will be, my up, an upcoming engagement, I'll be speaking at the National Diversity Women's Business Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C. in October. So if you're in D.C. or know people that would enjoy going to the conference, you know, definitely look into that. And please let me know if you'll be there. Communicate with me on my social media platforms. I'd love to know uh, who's there. Great. And I will include links to all of that in the show notes at thehappylawyerproject.com. So if you guys are out on a run or on the subway, wherever you may be right now, you can check that later. And thank you so much, Avery, for being a part of this project and for sharing your story and your knowledge with us today. Before I let you go, I'd love to ask you this final question, which I ask everybody who's been on the show. And that is, What do you think separates lawyers who are happy from lawyers who struggle to find happiness in life with a law degree? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that happy lawyers are those that don't let others define the term lawyer for you in the sense that don't let people tell you what you're supposed to do. Lawyers are trained in great skills that are transferable, that can be used in so many ways you know, either in the traditional sense or non-traditional sense. Bottom line is don't let others define the term lawyer for you. I love that. And I think it speaks so much to your points about authenticity and confidence in knowing who you are. So I hope people will get out there, define that term for themselves. And thank you again, Avery, for being on today. Oh, it was great talking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening, you guys, and spending some of your time with me today. I also want to say a big thank you to everybody who sent me an email, follows me on Instagram, reached out to me on LinkedIn, or left me a rating and review on iTunes. It means so much to me to hear from you and get your feedback. Last but certainly not least, I want to say a huge thank you to our newest sponsor, Felix Gray Glasses. If you're somebody who spends a significant amount of time in front of a screen, then you should head on over to felixgrayglasses.com forward slash happy lawyer. I promise your eyes will thank you for it. That's all I got for you today, lawyers. Until next time. Bye.